Yeah, they used to travel there really. Now he's an elephant. Yeah. What's your thing about that?
In the ancient world, various peoples lit fires to mark the turning of the light into winter season and to pray for the return of the light. The church has Christianized that practice in the lighting of the Advent rain. To us, these candles are a sign of the growing light of Christ who is coming again in all fullness into the darkness of our world. Until the dawning of that great day, we watch and wait in Holy Spirit for Christ's coming into the darkness of our world, lighting candles of hope, peace, joy, and love, and remembering the promises of God with prayer. Watch and wait for Christ's coming. We light this candle in hope, hear God's promises of hope. Mark 13, 24 through 27. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The season of Advent watches and waits in two directions. First, for Christ to be born, and second, for Christ to come. There are many contrasts and parallels in these two events. The birth of the baby Jesus comes on earth in a sweet and humbling stable. And Jesus promises to return to earth at the end of time with power, earthquakes, angels, and judgment. At his birth, there's a star in the east beckoning the Magi to the manger. At his second coming, there will be stars falling from the sky while the sun and moon go dark. Preparing ourselves to receive Jesus is about living our lives in faith to hope, to love, and to our most needy neighbors. As we wait for the coming of Jesus at Christmas and on the last day, let us keep awake and practice hope, love, and justice as part of our daily lives. This is an excerpt from um, a book that we are using this Advent season called Advent and Maria. What ways are you keeping awake to justice, hope, and love this Advent season? Let us pray. Faithful God, out of death you bring life. Renew us in hope. 
that we may be alert to the arrival of Christ's advent among us, God of promise, God of hope, and into our darkness come. Morning. We are doing an exciting uh, sermon series this month on uh, Advent and Narnia. Have any of you heard of the Lion, the Little Boy Room? I'll say you have. Have you read it? We're reading it right now. Well, I thought I would read. This is a very uh, not great version of it, but it was a simple version that I thought I could read this morning just to kind of give you an overview. I thought it would help you as well. Uh, but this is kind of a broken down, very small version of it, but let us hear this version of C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So once there were four children, their names were Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. One day, playing hide-and-seek, Lucy finds a wardrobe and goes in. She comes out on the other side, and there's a fond name, Mr. Cummings. He tells her she is in Narnia and invites her for tea. But inside his cozy home, Mr. Cummings starts to cry. He says the evil white witch has made it always winter, but never Christmas. Lucy goes back home to tell the others. Edmund sneaks into the wardrobe. He finds a witch who gives him candy, and he says he will help her keep it winter forever. When all four children go to Narnia, they meet Mr. and Miss Beaver. They learn about the great lion Aslan, and he can break the witch's spell. They want to go and help Aslan. Except for Edmund. He doesn't care about Narnia. He just wants more candy. On the way to Aslan, Peter, Susan, and Lucy meet Father Christmas. He gives them presents, but they miss Edmund. In her castle, the witch is angry at Edmund. He has not helped her. Because outside the snow is melting, spring is coming. Peter, Susan, and Lucy find Aslan. He is a lion, greater than all lions and big and bright like the sun, and he makes you feel safe. Aslan tells them they will be kings and queens and free Narnia, but the witch says Edmund belongs to her because he is selfish. To save Edmund, Aslan takes his place. The witch takes Aslan away. Everyone thinks the lion is gone forever. But the next morning, Lucy and Susan find Aslan alive and strong. Aslan uses his magic, and spring comes back, and Narnia is free. Aslan has won. Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy become kings and queens, and everyone in Narnia is happy. But one day they find a door, and when they step in, they are back home again. And that was only the beginning of all of their adventures. So what symbols of hope did you see this, or hear this? Do you know what hope means? Did you see any symbols of hope? Any good news? In this story, awesome. Winter was going away, right? What other symbols of hope? The same you had yet. How about um, that Edmund was rescued by Aslan? Is that a good symbol of hope? That spring was coming, and what about Father Christmas? We call him here. We call him Santa Claus. Right? Says it was always winter and never Christmas. For a hundred years. This is a, just a short uh, view of what's coming in the next three weeks, and especially starting today, about uh, helping and finding God in the midst of magical fantasy, but also in the midst of our hearts and in this Advent season that we hope and await for the arrival of Christ to come again and make us uh, new. So let us pray. So we repeat after me. Uh, dear God, help me. To stay alert to your presence and to have hope that all things will be made new and well. Amen.
we have a lot of exciting and wonderful things happening this month. So I mentioned to a few of them found in your bulletin. Um, first, we have our, our wonderful giving tree over in the chapel entryway. There's just a few tags left, I noticed, so that's wonderful. Tags for, um, to grab a gift for one of the seniors to help out for Christmas, and they are to be returned to room three by December 11th. We also have our children advent program on December 10th, so that's next Sunday at 9. Uh, but a surprise for all of you, I hope you all come to this wonderful, exciting thing. We are doing an intergenerational service children's program at 9, so all of you who come are going to take part in the service with costumes and fun, rejoicing and singing and spending time in, in the Word and hearing the good news. So come in and be a part of the wonderful morning of welcoming uh, Christ for us. So it'll be a fun new thing to try um, and let us join here. But that's 9 o'clock next Sunday. Then on the 10th, again, also next Sunday at 2.30 is the Festival of Lessons and Carols here. And uh, on December 16th, you will, there should be an insert in your bulletin for the Narnia night. Again, another family gener intergenerational uh, fun night of gathering together to just have fun together, do activities and eat snacks and just spend time in, in fellowship and joy with one another, all ages. So come and enjoy that. And then there's Christmas caroling on Sunday, December 17th. So if you are interested in caroling along with the group, just go ahead and contact Leanne or Jessica by December 15th so they know about them and how many are going to go for this caroling. You'll also see there is the announcement on sponsoring the Christmas stars again this year. And this year, the mission uh, donation is going to Cedar River, River Haven in Letts. Uh, it offers women in recovery a safe place to live, a positive employment opportunity, and a community of women on a similar journey. So your Christmas. You can purchase a Christmas star with the name of your loved ones and it'll be hung on the tree at the entrance. Um, and please do that by Sunday, December 17th. And one final announcement. Uh, looking ahead, I know it's January, even though we are in Advent, uh, following our Advent uh, sermon series, uh, we're going to be starting a series in January called You Ask the Question. Uh, basically, this will only work if you actually ask questions. So I, I'm asking for you to submit a, a question of faith, a question in scripture, something that you were just wanting to know more to grow your faith uh, by emailing it to me, or there is a gold box in the entryway of the chapel that there are papers there you can write your question on. Um, however you would like to do that, I will at some point make a Facebook post if you want to add on to that as well, just so that uh, I have them and, and we'll address those in a sermon series. So, are there any other announcements this morning? I think many of us have heard the news that um, longtime election member uh, Jim Stearns uh, passed away yesterday morning. The services will be later this week, but they are still being honored. Yeah, so. Uh, prayers for sure for and bar and for the service this morning. Are there any announcements or any? I wanted to just introduce myself to Jim Burke. He's a young guy, Owen Burger. My name is Eric Jeffies. Well, let us settle our hearts to hear and receive the word of God this morning. Our scripture passage comes from Mark chapter 13, verses 24 through 37. Hear these words. In those days, after the suffering of that time, the sun will become dark and the moon will give its light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the planets and other heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then they will see the human one coming in the clouds with great power and splendor. Then he will send the angel angels and gather together his chosen people from the four corners of the earth and from the end of the earth to the end of heaven. 
Learn this parable from the fig tree. After its branch becomes tender and it sprouts new leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, you know that he is near at the door. For I assure you that this generation won't pass away until these things happen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will certainly not pass away. But nobody knows when that day or hour will come. Not the angels in heaven, not the Son, only the Father knows. Watch out. Stay alert. You don't know when the time is coming. It is as if someone took a trip, left the household behind, and put the servants in charge, giving each one a job to do, and told the doorkeeper to stay alert. Therefore, stay alert. You don't know when the head of the household will come, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows in the early morning or at daybreak. Don't let him show up when you weren't expecting and find him sleeping. What I say to you, I say to all, stay alert. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. God, we give you our hearts today to hear and to receive from you. We are reminded of your love, and we thank you for your word that does that, that guides us, that nurtures our faith, and leads us closer to you. And we ask, God, as I ask this morning, that these words that I speak be your words for your people. May they be holy and pleasing to you, Lord, for you are my rock and my redeemer. Amen. We begin a, our sermon series on Advent and Narnia this Sunday, exploring the theological uh, joy and examples that C.S. Lewis has ingrained into this fantasy children's series, and how that connects to our story and our love of Jesus, and how together they give us wonderful images of what it means to await during this Advent season to have excitement and joy for the arrival of Christ, and hope that all things will be made well. Which is where our scripture passage comes in this morning, a typical Advent 1 scripture passage, Mark 13. An apocryphal passage, apocalyptic passage, I meant to say, which means that the end times, warning us of the end times being near, and what that might look like, that the stars falling from heavens and the sun no longer shining and the moon losing all of its light. We began the Advent season with the story of the end times where Christ returns again and makes all things new. An example, an image of hope. And hope is shown throughout all of the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe in many different ways and examples. C.S. Lewis integrated in very uh, slight and yet beautiful examples of how hope arose for the people and creatures of Narnia in symbols and in ways. The first one being the character of Lucy being a daughter of Eve or human entering into this magical world and not knowing that her entering in was a beginning of hope for the Narnians who have been trapped for a hundred years in winter by a wicked white witch, always winter, but never Christmas. We were reminded through of the images of hope as well, continuing to trickle in that as the closer the children arrive to Aslan, the more things begin to happen. Winter melts away, spring begins to appear, and then Father Christmas appears in the story which when Christmas has not happened over a hundred years, a symbol of hope beginning to break through the, the coldness and the darkness of the evil that was happening here. Mark 13 is a reminder that our hope is when Christ returns again. Advent is a season of waiting, not just for the birth of Christ, which has already happened. We celebrate that and we rejoice in it, but we are waiting for the second arrival of Christ, where Jesus comes again and makes all things new, where there's a new heaven and a new earth, and there's a beautiful joy and connection as we are reunited with Christ in heaven. While not addressed specifically in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, in the seventh book of the Chronicles of Narnia series, The Last Battle, C.S. Lewis has this imagery. He has Narnia falling away into darkness, the stars fall from the sky, the moon loses its 
glow and color and the sun fades away so that Narnia no longer will exist. And in the book, all of the characters except for Susan, who has fallen away from God and faith and, and, and grown out of story and make believe, all of the rest of the characters in all seven books, they return and witness Narnia fall. And in the midst of that return, they experience an even greater and more wonderful Narnia that they keep going higher up and further in. And lo and behold, they see Aslan again. And it is in this moment, just like in our passage, where there's actually hope and joy, because in this Narnia, they never have to leave. In Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and in all of the rest of the books, the, the humans have to go back. They have to leave the wardrobe, the magic of the entire land, and they have to go back into the real world that they are from, back into England, back into the war-torn city of London, in the house that they have been sent to as a place of refuge and safety where war is happening in their own home town. They return, but not in the end. Not when there is hope. They don't have to return because there was a train wreck and they all passed away and they end up finally reunited with Christ. That is the hope that Advent season brings. That's why we start with it. We start with it because it begins to get our minds wrapped around this image and love of God of Christ returning again and making all things new. Rachel Held Evans writes, the whole story of Advent is the story of how God can't be kept out. God is present. God is with us. God shows up not with a parade, but with the whimper of a baby. Not among the powerful, but among the marginalized. Not to the demanding, but to the humble. The whole story of Advent is the story of how God cannot be kept out. That God is present. In the line of which in the wardrobe, Aslan cannot be kept out. While there is a hundred years of winter, Aslan still breaks through the deep, dark magic of the white witch. Aslan, God, cannot be kept out. The hope in this story is that while things might seem fearful and, and dark, Christ will come in and make all things new. Advent story and, and Advent season is about the light of Christ, the light of Christ that breaks into the darkness that nothing can extinguish that light. That light of Christ that in the end time is so bright that there won't be a need for stars and moons and suns, but simply the light and brilliance of Christ will be shining through. Advent is a season of hope because we know that the way things are today are not how they were meant to be. It seems overwhelming in the last few months. I have been at the bedside of five different hospitals visiting church members, and I have done a couple of funerals already, and one coming here in probably this week. And all it seems some weeks is a heaviness of death and sickness, and it's heavy. And the darkness is heavy. But the early Christians and us have an opportunity to see in the midst of this fearful passage about the stars falling from heaven a hope that is only found through the good news of Christ coming and redeeming and bringing good news, bringing a new heaven. I, I, I love the image uh, in all of these books. And, and I can't help it, every time I listen or read through the Chronicles of Narnia, it's beautiful. The way C.S. Lewis connected the story of Christ's love and put, put it into characters like a lion and animals and creatures that talk and speak. But most importantly, as I described in the last battle, it is so beautiful to read the, the part where Aslan tells Lucy, no, you don't have to leave. You get to stay. This is now where you belong. That together, they are, will be together. No longer will she be sent back, but now embraced fully in the love of Aslan. What a beautiful story to end with and to begin our Advent season with. What a hope that things will not remain the way they are, but that Christ will come and everything we know will fall away, but the new heaven and the new earth.
birth will be even glorious than the one we experience. Christ's arrival will give us hope beyond anything we can imagine. And we tie that into a land of, of, of make-believe, but the, the characters, especially Lucy and, and Susan and Peter and Edmund and the Lion and the Wardrobe, they are just like us in many ways. They know the hardness and the struggles of the life and the world they are in. They were in the world, the same world that we were in. And they have this opportunity that most of us can't even imagine, even though it's make-believe, this magical world takes them away from the hardness of that and gives them an opportunity to see the greatness and beauty of God. And, in, and later on in the series, Aslan will tell them, he says, while you know me as am Aslan here, you will know me by another name in your own world. Hinting at the name of, of God for them, not in the magical make-believe world that C.S. Lewis has created, but in our understanding and grasp of God's love, that it is Christ that Aslan represents. The Christ who will come again and make all things right, bring hope into the brokenness of our world. This is the good news of Advent season, but it also, along with this scripture passage, is a warning to be alert, to be awake. Don't get settled. Don't ignore the signs. Don't just live and not see God's presence right now. As Rachel Held Evans said, again, the whole story of Advent is the story of how God cannot be kept out. So the white witch thought Aslan would not be able to come in. She had kept the spell for a hundred years, and so far so good, things were looking good for the white witch. But Aslan cannot be kept out. God cannot be kept out. We are alert to God's presence even today, and our Advent calls us for a season of being aware of God around us and with us. God, Emmanuel, God with us. Where can you see the hope of God spring forth each day around you? I began with kind of an overdraft of the places in which hope showed throughout C.S. Lewis's book and many examples of that. We have that same opportunity around us to see God's presence and hope because God is active today. God is not kept out by the brokenness and the darkness of the world. God is a God of winning love, a spirit that continues to work upon our hearts, that we have moments of hope and grace. <coughs> moments of, of hope that fills our hearts and gives us the joy and the love. Where do you see God's presence? Where do you see the hope? Lead into that. Let that be the encouragement as you await for the arrival of Christ. Let that be the strength to guide you on this journey along, to connect and be known by a God who loves you, and a God who would come in human form, Emmanuel, to be with you, to die for you, to resurrect from the dead, defeating all the darkness, being the eternal life that gives us hope and peace. Let us pray. God, we thank you that you are a God who is active, a God who cannot be kept out by the darkness even of this world, not even by a tomb, that you resurrect and come and fill our hearts with new life. Let us be alert to your presence. Let us have hope and see the hope in the midst of the darkness around us. Let us know that you are always present and wanting. Let us live into the imaginative story of ch children and play and find you even in the midst of making you. God, we lay all of this at your feet today as we pray for peace. God, that you might be with those who are doing the surgery to prepare for this physical body and those as they care for him. And God, we also pray for the Sturms family in the capacity. In a moment of darkness, the darkness of grief, the darkness of the heaviness of the world and the weight of death, God, we know that you are amongst that evil, that your hope even shines forth in illness and in death, that your strength gives power to those who feel weak. So we ask for all of this, God, as we together join in the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. As we prepare our hearts for communion this day, we prepare it by laying it all at the feet of Christ. To not hold anything back, not hold ourselves back, but being fully embraced by God and loved by being vulnerable and confessing things that we no longer need to hold on to, things that maybe we kept because we don't want to have others know. And this is an opportunity that we can confess and lay it down so that we can be fully embraced with mercy and grace. Let us pray. We confess that we are not ready. We call on you to rend the heavens and come down. And yet, we aren't ready for you to rend our hearts and enter in. When it comes to meeting you face to face, we hesitate. We fear what you will find in us and among us. We are uncertain of that we really want our lives to be turned upside down by the good news. We want the hope that comes with knowing you are coming to us, but we're not sure we're ready for the shock of that hope. Forgive us, we pray. Forgive us from our fear that we might joyfully live in the hope that shakes us up and turns us around to follow you. Hear the good news. God is the water, and we are the clay. We are the work of God's hands, and in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us prepare to receive our Lord's table this day with our Praise and thanksgiving to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Amen. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turn away and our love failed, your love remains steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So with your people on earth and the company of heaven, we praise your name and join with their unending name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, the heaven and the earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be the light of the nations. You scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts and have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You put down the mighty from their throne and exalt those of low degree. You fill the hungry with good things, and the rich you send empty away. Your own Son came among us as a servant to be Emmanuel, your presence with us. He humbled himself in obedience to your will and freely accepted death on the cross. And by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, he gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, our Lord Jesus took bread. He blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body that is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, 
He gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So in remembrance of these your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice the new Christ offers for us as we proclaim that mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Cry, your Holy Spirit, on us gathered here on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, till Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly table. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Reminder, our table is always open that all are welcome to come and to receive the grace and love of God. If I can have an assistant, I never ask anyone if they would just follow me. Oh, I have one. Thank you. Oh, my God. 
us your love. Set us free from all that would oppress us and enslave us, so that we may share this bread with those who are hungry. When the world's pleasures leave us thirsty and joyless, guide us to quench the thirst of our dry spirits here, that we might rise up and sing, Joy to the world, the Lord is God. Let us stay at it again.